All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webinar, Corporate AI Policies, Managing Risk by Implementing Responsible Use Policies and Best Practices in the Workplace. My name is Matthew Pohl. I'm a partner in Saul Ewing's Litigation Group out of our Baltimore office. And I'm joined today by Teresa Payton, the CEO and Chief Advisor at Fortalist Solutions. Teresa is a globally renowned cybersecurity thought leader and one of the United States' most prominent and respected voices in cybersecurity. I'm also joined by Bridget O'Connor, who is a partner and the Chief Operating Officer at Fortalist Solutions. Bridget is a seasoned operations and management professional responsible for Fortalist's operations and recruiting. Before we jump in, there are a few housekeeping announcements. First, as to Q&A, questions can be submitted through the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to answer all questions submitted during the webinar. However, should we run out of time, we will follow up individually via email after the webinar ends. And as for CLE, <clears throat> this program has been approved for one substantive continuing legal education credit in California, Delaware, Florida, Illinois, Minnesota, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island, with an application pending in Virginia. As a CLE provider, we must be able to verify your attendance. Therefore, at random points during this webinar, we will display and verbally announce two numeric reporting codes that you must record and report back to us using the CLE survey that you received in your webinar reminder email. The survey will also open automatically in your browser at the completion of the program. We will then send you your certificate of attendance once we receive your survey response. Please be sure to respond to the Soul Ewing CLE survey with your numeric codes within five days of the program. After the webinar, you will receive an email that will include links to the webinar recording and supplemental presentation materials. And the provision and receipt of the information in this program is not legal advice, does not create a lawyer-client relationship, and should not be acted on without the now seeking professional counsel who have been informed of the specific facts. With that, let's begin. So before we begin the substantive part of our conversation today, we'd like to do a couple of polls. The first poll is, does your organization allow its employees to use generative AI tools? Yes or no? I'll give it a few seconds for everyone to vote. And so, well, pr pretty good. 70% says yes. So now the second poll with that information in mind, does your organization have a written AI use policy in place? And that should be up in a second. Wow, actually you six, almost 70%, that's pretty good. It's actually more than I expected and more than in my experience in talking to in-house counsel, information security officers and HR managers at companies. And Teresa and Bridget, what's your experience with those numbers, your thoughts on those numbers? Yeah, I mean, I think seeing that 32% uh, said that yes, they have a written policy in place, that gives me a lot of optimism. Um, pragmatic optimism, of course, but uh, I think that's a, a great start in the right direction. I'd love to see that number be higher, um, but uh, I, I think that's that's a great number. I would agree. Been. Yeah, I was just thinking the first poll is kind of interesting because it's it's almost the opposite, um, which gives me a little bit of, of pause to see the, yes, we're using them and then no policy in place. So would love to see those maybe a little more equal. Well, I think that's what makes today's presentation so timely. So exactly. if we could, let's go to the third slide, please. So here we are, right? It is definitely a new paradigm. AI is here. It has been garnering a lot of headlines recently, especially generative AI. I think around late fall, I'm sorry, late spring, early summer, chat GPT was making headlines everywhere. It really entered the consciousness of America. There's been a lot of widespread adoption um, amongst college students, professionals, people using it in 
their daily life for all sorts of tasks, um, artists. Um, and we're here really to talk about the use of it within organizations to identify some of the risk and to talk about some of the best practices and how we can all use judgment and using a very powerful technology response. Um, and I think to the headline you see there, I think we are no longer unaware of it, but I do disagree. It is slowly taking over the world. I think it is not necessarily taking over the world, but is becoming more uh, a part of our lives every single day. So, so artificial intelligence. So let's talk about what it is a little bit and give a little background before we get into some of the concepts for governance and a risk policy framework. So really artificial intelligence, the way I like to think about it at a very high level is software that mimics human reasoning and human decision-making. Um, there's algorithms that has fed a lot of data, you know, there's training data, um, and that allows the, the system is designed to generate recommendations, draw conclusions, um, we solve problems on very specific tasks. Today's artificial intelligence is task specific. Um, I think we're still a ways away from a very general sort of project management type of artificial intelligence, but we're getting there. There are advances all the time. Um, AI, OpenAI and companies like that are announcing new, new tools, more updated models and ways that they are enhancing the accuracy of, of their technology. Um, here are some examples of how AI is already used in their everyday life. Siri and Alexa, right? You all are very familiar with those. My kids use those as their personal assistants to sometimes to my dismay. Search engines, deep fakes, right? We see those in the political arena. I'm sure Teresa and Bridget can talk about those and they will in a moment. But you know, in May, we saw deep fakes that you may remember the fake Drake, right? Music that came out where somebody uh, created a song, an audio, an audio file that had the same lyrical style and the same beat style as Drake and put it out on the internet and everyone believed it was actually Drake. Self-driving cars, video games, and here as well as some common corporate uses. Um, Fraud detection, financial institutions are using um, AI to monitor transactions, facial or voice recognition, um, process automation, data management, chatbots, targeted uh, consumer behavior tools, and, and things of that nature. And here is just some, some general terminology. We can get into the weeds a little bit, but we're not going to go too far into, into the technology behind AI. Um, Gen AI is the one that we're talking about. It's really a subset of AI that is used to create content, a variety of different kinds of content. It could be text, it could be images, software code, audio files, videos, et cetera. Uh, GPT is the GPT and chat GPT. Uh, generative just refers to the ability to generate content. Pre-trained means that it is trained or is fed billions and billions of data points to sort of understand or try to uh, pr provide answers in a predictive fashion. Transformer is sort of the act of taking the prompts, the input, and providing the output or the content to you. Uh, you probably have seen the term LLM, large language models, which are models that are based on language, based on millions and millions of parameters that will take a prompt, text prompt, and generate out text to you, or even an image. Programs like Midjourney and Dolly, those are, those are image generators that are LLMs, um, natural language processing, uh, natural language understanding, those are two forms in which the, the large language model was able to communicate with humans um, for our purposes today. National, natural language understanding is really important because computers, unlike people, um, don't understand context. And that's what makes these tools useful. So for instance, if I were to say, hey, Siri, it's really hot in here, crack the window, right? Without any understanding, it won't know how to respond to that. Or if I ask it a question like, you know, What's the weather outside? Should I wear a jacket? Or um, you know, what's it doing out there? It won't really understand those kinds of questions without context. And it's that kind of context, the, the digestion of you know all the different books and poems and all the scholarly literature that's out there and the prompts and all the information that is being fed into the system to the models to, to train it is the understanding that it needs to communicate with us on an effective level. Hallucination is an interesting term. Um, I'm sure Teresa can give some interesting examples about this. It's just simply when the system makes up facts that don't exist. Um, unlike my nine-year-old who, when I ask her a question and she doesn't know the answer, she'll tell me she doesn't know the answer. Um, ChatGPT won't tell you it doesn't know the answer and it'll, it'll make something up. And then we have Copilot, which is an AI plugin for everything. It's just you know, AI being used to generate code, to generate applications, 
You see it on things like GitHub and all these um, all these websites where people are using AI for a variety of purposes and to, to, to lay, layer the complexity in AI tools. So generative AI, here's just a little more background with it and then we'll talk about what some of the uses. So really it's not, it's a tool that's used in a predictive fashion. You provide a prompt, um, that's the input and, and it's optimized for fluency and it tries to give you something that it thinks you want to hear or read. It's not, importantly, it's not developed for optimized for accuracy. It's best for repetitive language um, and phraseology. And here are some, some examples of what you can do with it. You can create content, like I mentioned, a variety of different kinds of files that mimics human, human output, classify content, characterize content, you can summarize content. Um, knowledge retrieval and management is a big use of generative AI. For instance, if a company has uh, a variety of commercial contracts, you can use Gen AI to quickly scroll through those and see, for instance, you know, are there any distinctions in our important provisions like indemnity or ownership of IP or um, incident and, and breach response provisions in various contracts. You could even, for instance, use generative AI to say, write me an essay about Shakespeare and the voice of Shakespeare. Or if you're a, a lawyer like myself, you can use Gen AI, Gen AI to write, write a legal brief um, using terms and phrases that, for instance, a judge might use. If you have that judge in your case, you say, write me a brief that you know, is similar to the, to the style and language of Judge X. So there's a variety of different uses. It's not simply a question and answer tool, although that's oftentimes how it's being used. And um, it's really being used to, to drill down once you uh, get some, some ba uh, basic prompts. And, um, but here's, here's some other, other ways of using it. it, it but at, the uses are essentially endless. And one of the challenges is being good at, at developing prompts. Um, Teresa, Bridget, anything to add on, on this slide here? The uh, one interesting thing that we've we've seen in the cybersecurity world is the increase in more, uh, how shall I say it, grammatically correct phishing emails. Um, and this is something that um, we've seen, you know, I think we all kind of accepted to, to not click links and we've all been educated properly. But what's happening now is they're, they're putting, uh, the, the bad actors obviously are putting the requests into chat GBT and saying, please write this like an American, an American dialect. And before where I'd be like, oh, look at all the errors. This is obviously not real. It's definitely becoming more authentic. And so uh, what, that's really one of uh, obviously our concerns from the cybersecurity perspective is how is this going to be exploited by, by bad actors? Yeah, and I, I just to add on to that, um, so I've used it, uh, like, for example, but again, you have to have the right guardrails. I've been working on an algorithm for benchmarking for the company, and I didn't have anybody to talk to about it. And when I did my old school math, it wasn't my coding wasn't right, Matt. And I didn't want to just put the whole algorithm into generative AI because now it belongs to everybody else. So I converted it to a macro, pulled the piece out that I thought was wrong, gave that piece of the macro to ChatGPT and it fixed my error. I, something I've been working on for an hour, like literally I could not figure out where my error was. It fixed it. I put it back in the larger macro. It matched my old school math. I converted it to code and the benchmarking work. So I, there's incredible power and opportunity here, but you have to have the right guardrails. Otherwise, your trade secrets could end up sort of a, generally available to the rest of the public. Um, the other thing that I've seen it used for, uh, and I actually did a couple of test cases of this, is creating customer service chatbots and doing it in a way that it's a lot easier to do than kind of even six months ago with the technology. And so being able to have a helpful way for even um, Americans with Disability Act, you know, people who might be vision impaired, hearing impaired, and being able to use generative AI to help you generate that code, test the bot, and give people a more accessible website. Um, and I actually tested it out using a tool this past weekend on our own web page. I'm not going to put it in production because I haven't red teamed it yet. But, but again, I think there's an opportunity here to really take human ideas, human kind of best practices and thinking and automate it at a speed and scale we didn't have available to us before. Next slide, please. <clears throat> here are just, so here are a few examples of Gen AI tools that are 
um, out there for use. Obviously, everyone is familiar with ChatGPT. Uh, Facebook and Meta has its own version, its own LLM called Llama. Um, Microsoft has Copilot. Midjourney is, is the image generating tool along with Dolly and Stable Diffusion and, and other similar tools. Jasper and Synthesis AI. And here we have the first CLE code, uh, 32155. And Matt, don't, don't, for, don't forget, uh, Elon Musk didn't want to be left out. So now we have Grok, which right. I think should be named Gronk, but he picked Grok for the name. <laughs> Not only that, just today, Amazon released that they are now developing their LLM. So it, it's on now, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, it's everywhere. There are, there are plenty of other tools out there as well. Just We didn't attempt to make an exhaustive list, but put some of the ones that are here are more publicly well-known and Next slide, please. So interesting that Teresa mentioned losing trade secrets and um, security breaches and, and IP uh, losses. And it's not always the act of a, of a bad actor or a, a former employee with a grudge against the company. You'd be surprised at uh, sort of the loss to and value to your company and its IP and data breaches that can happen from employees who are just sloppy. So here's an interesting case study. Uh, it was from this year, actually. Samsung, a large company with a significant in-house department and very sophisticated engineers who I have no doubt are um, have you know NDAs and confidentiality SOPs in place and understand the importance of IP to their company. Well, within a month, there were three separate breaches um, voluntarily using um, chat GPT. And here they are sort of laid out for you in bullet points. The first is it took source code from proprietary source code from the company's semiconductor database and just like Teresa did, asked ChatGPT to fix the bugs in, in the software and query whether the ChatGPT is able to fix their bugs, but potentially their software code is now, you know, within at least at OpenAI, uh, probably not in the training model of uh, ChatGPT, but if it's updated with this information, because um, there is a date cutoff for, for OpenAI's LLM, this could end up in the training data. It now belongs to uh, OpenAI and if it is used in the LLM and say ChatGPT 5.0 and a competitor puts in a prompt and asks for something like this, it could, they could potentially get this information. Um, a second time was uh, our, an engineer at Samsung put internal meeting notes, um, highly classified information into ChatGPT and asked the system to convert that information into a presentation. And a third time, a, uh, an engineer at Samsung took a highly confidential process um, put it in a prompt and ask ChatGPT to optimize the test sequences to, to help fix problems with the chips. So as a result, Samsung likely lost its trade secret protection uh, in this information and ChatGPT now can claim ownership of this information. So where do we go from here, right? What are we here to talk about today is how to avoid situations like this. Uh, by next slide, please, putting in an important written policy and developing a framework for your company to do so by analyzing the risks, looking at some of the opportunities to use AI and you know, best practices to, to manage employees. So here we lay out some bullet points on our risk analysis framework. So the first the first bullet point is, you know, what is the data that is being used to train the Gen AI tool? So that, the big issue there is that we don't have a lot of transparency. Um, you know, it can be a large set of open source data like the internet, it can be proprietary data, or it can be aggregated data from a variety of different sources. Different sources. And it can also include your data. Um, a lot of companies and, and law firms in particular are advertising that they are developing their own LLM, their own models. Quite frankly, what they're probably doing is taking an existing LLM and, and tweaking it with their own proprietary data. Um, some, some important people to think about in this whole process are who are intended users of, of the AI tool, right? You have your employees, you have to monitor them and understand what programs are using, the use cases that they're using it for, and what are they doing when you are not actively watching what they're doing? For instance, are they using personal devices, et cetera? Suppliers and contractors who have your data, contingent workers, and also your customers. Um, the intended use case, the next bullet point, is important because you have to understand um, who's using or how your employees are using generative AI. And there are different ways to talk about in more detail how to sort of, sort of slice and dice that. Um, do you want to have an all or nothing approach? Do you want to phase it in? Um, over several over several months, have certain departments use you know generative AI for certain purposes. Get a comfort level with it. For instance, feel like you can have your R and D team 
use it for certain purposes or your finance team use it for certain purposes or high level employees and then roll it out more broadly within your organization. We're going to talk about uh, some of those risks. And Teresa, do you want to touch on some of the, the other bullet points on this slide? Yeah, sure. Um, so one thing I do want people to kind of think about, because this can be a little daunting, to layering something else on top of all of your other priorities. And one thing I want everybody to be thinking about is we have a construct for this and you can pull those threads forward. For example, when I was working in banking and the internet was now going to be available to everybody inside the bank, banking employees, one of the first things, because we weren't exactly sure where search terms were going, um, how they were being stored, where they were put, put we came up with a, a governance approach around accountability. And we said we can never put customer data into a search term and go outside to the internet because we don't know what's happening with that data. Fast forward to today, um, you can take those same um, kind of tried and true lessons learned, whether it's from search engines being in the workplace to cloud being available in the workplace. You know, consumer cloud was available before really enterprise cloud was. The iPhone was focused on consumers. There wasn't really an enterprise application for the iPhone when it first came out. So all of those tried and true lessons learned, you can actually just reapply them here. Um, so I would say a couple of things, you know, when you're thinking about prompt guidelines, having very simple reminders, you know, we um, both in banking, but also um, at Bridget's and my time at the White House, we would bring in adult learning specialists. And one of the things that really resonated with me is they said, most of the time you can give people a list of do's and don'ts, but most of the time it's most important to tell them three or less things don't do because it's too hard to remember everything else in the span of a work day. So maybe just keep it very simple and say, when in doubt, don't ever put customer data into one of these tools. When in doubt, you know, and, and give you, only you know what's gonna be right for you on that. I would also say on human intervention, this will be so important. So just like um, on other sort of delivery channels, if you will, where you can monitor, you can coach, you can do, a side by side and listen in, um, you know, and and let people know. Of course, disclose. You know, this could be recorded or somebody could be monitoring this for customer service. You could do the same here, where you can do side by sides with people who are using these generative AI tools on behalf of your organization. So you can ask to record um, things. You can do a side by side. We can be together um, now, you know, in the sort of post pandemic, you can do screen shares as well. And that can be a great way to sort of do that um, coach mentor, but also that maker checker rule where you're enforcing sort of just in time governance and coaching and mentoring on top of a framework you've already trained everybody on. And then the last thing I would say for anybody who has said, look, we've already said for now, we have a policy, we're not using this. People have their own personal devices at work. Chances are they wanna do a great job for you. And the idea that they're not using this at all, I, I think is um, a little too optimistic they are going to use it because they want to do a good job for you. So instead, if you're not going to be using it as a policy, consider making an investment in training around how to think about these technologies in your personal life and how to protect your privacy while you're using these tools. So that will naturally transfer over to how they think about your workplace. And Bridget, I don't know if you've got anything you want to add. I think what you just said at the end there, Teresa, is perfect about pulling the thread of what we've already done. So we we want folks to obviously we've invested in training about you know their IT security policies when they're at work. But one of the issues we we always are worried about here at Fortalis is. Um, are they doing the same things at home? Is their home network protected? Well, I would say the same thing here, right? Uh, just like any other policy, whether or not, you know, folks are bringing their devices to work, they want to go fast, they're multitasking, they have a lot of responsibilities, the temptation will be there. But again, don't think of this as something that won't be accepted uh, by the employees because we've already, again, kind of went through this process, uh, again, as Teresa was mentioning, and all the various iterations as we evolve, 
uh, technologically. So I would caution folks just to say, um, we're not going to have it. Uh, that's that's definitely not a realistic approach. Yeah, I mean, before we jump to the next slide, I think that employees realize it provides efficiencies in their tasks and they wanna be freed up to do all the various things they have to do. And so you know, all the companies that I speak with, they understand their employees are at least using AI, at least as a first step or a starting point to drafting that business plan, writing that document, creating those marketing materials. So let's go to the next slide, please. So who are the AI actors? No, it's not the Terminator, <laughs> but as we mentioned before, there are a variety of people to keep in mind as you are thinking about AI use governance within your organization. Of course, your employees, as I mentioned, third-party suppliers, but recently uh, the regulators and the government have taken a more proactive role in this. Um, you know, just last week and the day before Halloween, our President Biden issued his 100-page executive order that touched on many different aspects of uh, AI use both within organizations at the employer employee level, um, data privacy, um, the FDA has some guidances in place for the use of AI within medical devices, the FTC is all over this as well. And so is the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. Uh, they issued a, a guidance at the end of September and the EEOC, of course, they issued a guidance in May relating to use of AI within organizations for automated decision-making and that's less about generative AI, but it also focuses, is your organization, for instance, using artificial intelligence for job performance reviews, resume screening, um, and the corollary there is, you know, for institutions like financial institutions, companies that uh, provide mortgages, consumer loans, credit cards, and you may be using, for instance, AI in the first instance to, to screen applicants. And while this is all happening in the U.S., uh, overseas in the EU, they are finalizing the EU AI Act, which is a comprehensive um, approach to dealing with AI, different than the approach that's being taken here in the United States, where it's a, a risk tiered approach with four levels of risk. Um, at the highest level is never acceptable things that monitor and profile individuals all the way down to like acceptable uses, maybe like you know, chatbots that you might get a reservation for Marriott to use. Um, and then, you know, there's also separate regulations being issued in and laws passing in Japan and China, elsewhere. Um, I'm sure Teresa and, and Bridget have a, a lot to say about this, but my, my perspective is that this is going to end up being the GDPR 2.0, where um, the EU acted first with a very comprehensive statute that caught up a lot of American businesses that have customers and data subjects in Europe. And then here in the U.S., we have a very, you know, fractured or industry-specific approach, state-by-state -state approach. And it seems like the same thing is playing out again. And I'm sure you guys can talk about cyber criminals as well. You already did. Phishing emails being suddenly so well written. And not only are they well written and lack typos, but they also have oftentimes logos and other hallmarks that they look like they're from a legitimate financial institution. So I know you're waiting for what your thoughts are, Bridget and Teresa, on the regulatory and the cyber criminal aspect of this, of this issue. Yeah, on the just one item on the regulatory, because we, we could go all day on that 100 page <laughs> executive order. But um, one one thing to be thinking about, there is a section um, within the executive order that does talk about infrastructure as a service. And it remains to be seen because executive orders compel departments and agencies. But since they tend to be your regulators, it sort of rolls downhill, so to speak. Um, and it actually mentions in there that when there's infrastructure as a service, that you have to register foreign agents who are using it and collect things such as their IP address, their payment information, and then monitor whether or not they are using it for unethical purposes. And this is like a level of, of detail that actually is in direct conflict in the United States with some of the state privacy laws. So for example, California's CCPA, which is gonna become CRPA, if you take an IP address and you collect it along with an email address or other identifiable information, that's actually considered a violation. And so there's a lot that remains. Um, I've got more questions than answers right now on the, on the regulatory aspect of this, but so much of it is going to be hidden. It's gonna be collected and aggregated and not really seen, so to speak. It's not gonna be right, you know, obvious. 
Um, and then on cyber criminals, yes, I, I couldn't agree more. There's a variety of different things that we are seeing cyber criminals do. So for example, um, just like we would use it as good people, good ethical people trying to do good business practices, they're looking for search engine optimization terms. They're using it to sift through mountains of alerts by all of the different large big tech companies saying, we have this vulnerability announcement. There's this zero day vulnerability. There's this coming out in a patch. And they're able to sift and sort through all of this data and then take advantage of it. So they're not sitting down and saying, write me a malware attack path for these companies, but they can actually sift and sort through all of these announcements and then start to use it at a speed and scale to create those programs to take advantage of the vulnerabilities. And also I will say it doesn't always get it right, but you, again, you can, um, it's not just even saying make it American English versus UK English, but you can also say things like, um, you know, use a tone uh, as if this person is Matthew McConaughey and from Texas, use a Northeastern tone and integrate into the email um, how the different sports teams are doing. So you can actually become more familiar and colloquial in the way it's written and English doesn't have to be your first language. It's gonna make attribution really hard. You know, we oftentimes will look at if we see something in Russian or in Chinese or different notes um, when we're doing sort of a digital investigation on a case, uh, people with a uh, linguistic background can say, oh, Russian isn't their first language. You can tell by the way they wrote Russian or they used a translator to write this. They don't actually speak Russian. Attribution is going to be very hard because generative AI does a great job with translation. Again, it's not always perfect, but it's getting better every day. Yeah. And then two points before we get to the next slide, sort of on the bad actors. Uh, you know, chat, everyone knows ChatGPT. Well, there's a sort of correlated product called Worm GPT which is an AI tool that is dedicated to, or the purpose of which is to develop malware to get into systems and hack them. And so if you think that the bad guys are smart enough and are one step ahead of you now in developing malware, well now they've got sort of Lex Luthor type powers to further their their, their bad acts. And sort of casually this summer, there was a, a hackers convention. I think it was in Las Vegas. And the winner of the hackers convention, he got ChatGPT to give him someone's credit card numbers. So that's what we're looking at and how, and so when you have employees using you know, these powerful tools at, at, at your organization and with your company sensitive data or a third party has your company sensitive data, you have to be on the guard for the bad actors, but also the sloppy actors. So let's talk about the next slide and how we can also put together a corporate policy to deal with some of these risks. So my big takeaway, one of my main takeaways from today to everybody on this webinar should be be proactive not reactive, right? These are risks and technology the like we have we have not seen before. So I think it's important to get out ahead of it. You know, kudos to the 32% that do have written AI policies in place. Um, I have talked to some you know, in-house lawyers who have said, well, you know, we'll just worry about it when 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 something goes wrong, let the chips fall where they may. Um, in my humble opinion, that is sort of the wrong way of going about it. I think you have to have policies in place uh, sooner rather than later, whether they're even drafts, just start thinking about it. And, um, you know, to Teresa's point, they should sort of dovetail with your other existing policies, whether they're an existing cyber policy or data loss prevention policy or a confidentiality, confidentiality policy. Those are good templates to at least look at or starting points to start thinking about how to address some of these issues. Of course, you have to govern when and how employees can use AI uh, to perform their work. And you know, there's different different approaches right now with this technology still being new, so to speak, and things changing so quickly. Um, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. As I mentioned early in the webinar, you can sort of phase in the use of AI within certain departments or with certain employees who might be uh, more sophisticated than other employees, and figure out you know is is this tool or this task, this use case right for my business? Let's test it out for a few months. Um, see how it looks, see what kind of results we're getting. And that will also give you some important information to develop metrics when you want to assess how your employees are using it down the road. Are they complying with your policy, for example, if you're going to run a gap analysis? Um, my other big takeaway, my second big takeaway, you're getting two of them in this one slide, the last one will come later, is that a policy has to be, uh, by design, has to be specific to your organization. 
Um, you can certainly find on Google or LinkedIn template policies um, that I don't think really serve a company's purpose. Uh, they have to be tailored to your company's culture, your company's business and uh, objectives, but also its risk tolerances. I don't think a policy needs to be either two pages long or 27 pages. I think there's something in the middle that everybody can agree on that employees can understand and that they will read and follow. And um, the last two points here, of course, we need C-level, uh, C-suite buy-in and, you know, formulating a policy. I'm sure, Teresa, you see this all the time in dealing with cyber. You need to have you know, various stakeholders involved, get different subject matter experts at the table to give you sort of their, their view, understand how this looks from their department and how they see this tool being used, the best uses and, and the risks that each might face. Yeah, you bring up a great point. And um, also think about your implementation. So for example, you have a lot of internal work that maybe doesn't collect or interface with your customers. So that internal work of copy editing or synthesizing or grabbing some research or looking back in history, that can have one set of training and governance and policies. The thing to be thinking about is if you are gonna be using generative AI for or using a vendor who is building it to do things such as customer service chatbots, uh, sort of helpful hints here and there, Q and A, password resets, anything like that, that's where you're gonna to have to think a little bit more around sort of the engineering and create before you even get to that framework you really kind of look at your code of conduct and the commitments you've already made as part of your brand promise so what do you need to do to be transparent accountable fair um, and then of course privacy and security and so i would i would kind of think about that framework first underneath your brand promise before you even get into sort of the engineering ins and outs of how are we going to do this and what do the privacy laws say, what do the security frameworks say, is really just sort of setting as a business, here are our guiding principles, here's, here's how we chart our course to the North Star, and then get into sort of the engineering element. So I, I think there's a, a couple of different ways to kind of look at the rules, the governance, the framework and training. There's the internal work, then there's trade secrets, proprietary data, and then there's sort of the customer facing and the privacy and security elements that go with each one of those different bodies of work. And the next slide, please. <clears throat> so here's some AI policy considerations. Of course, the first one is, you know, a no brainer, right? A policy should be clear and easy for employees to understand and follow. But I think in practice, um, that may not be that, that easy. A policy doesn't have to be super technical. It can really just explain we, the, the what generative AI is in, in general terms that it can be used to create content and some of the risks in, in general terms. For instance, if you're a healthcare company, of course your employees should understand that you may have HIPAA protected data and that by putting um, sensitive personal information into uh, a prompt or a web-based platform, right, that, that information might be lost forever or might be a violation of a law or a regulation. Um, should, policy should do its best to ex explain the risk like I just described. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a policy should reflect company culture and practice, right? There is really no one size fits all approach, I don't think. And as Teresa mentioned before, right, employee training is important. Um, you might give a little more color on that as well as developing metrics. I feel like that's probably more in your sweet spot with a lot of your cyber your background. Sure. And I, I know Bridget's got some opinions here as well. Um, so again, I, what I would say is once you kind of create your policy, have have an all hands. And then each year you probably have your employee sign an employee handbook. And whatever policy you roll out here should be added to that employee handbook. Uh, but have an all hands where you go over the policy and you invite people to ask questions. I would also create some type of a governance structure where as people start to see new generative AI tools released on sort of the consumer side of things um, that they can actually submit it in a proposal format for somebody inside your organization to look at and say whether or not it's a tool that would be appropriate for your organization's use. 
Um, because if you don't, they're going to use it anyway, without going through a process. And I've found over the years, one of the best practices I've seen in organizations is giving employees a voice to say, hey, here's something I'm using in my personal life. I would love to use it at work. Is there a vetting process where I can submit things that help me in my personal life? Um, and maybe we'll get an opportunity to use it at work. So that would be something else that I would um, recommend as you're doing your training and, and rollouts. Yeah, yeah. I would, okay, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say, I, I agree with what Teresa said in terms of making the process very transparent and open to the employees to make it welcoming so that they do bring those forward, but also remembering that this is not a, you know, you know, once done it and, and forget it, rinse and forget it, because it does have to be updated constantly. So I love the idea of, you know, the handbook being signed every year, but there's probably a training that has to be updated every year. We all have to do security training. This, as any technology, it's constantly evolving new things, uh, not only from the technical, but the regulatory and privacy issues. Um, and especially heavy training for the IT and security teams, right? I know we're not getting too heavy into that today, but that is definitely something you want to make sure you're investing in as an organization to help those teams be able to, to spot anything that is ob obviously abnormal or, or out of the ordinary um, in terms of the employees' behaviors and practices. So that's the only thing. Sorry, Matt, for cutting you off there. I oh, that's okay. No, no, I'm sorry. And then, you know, to the point about a handbook or training where those will allow you to, to develop metrics to understand which employees are engaged and there are other ways to understand you know who which employees for instance are is it my my r d department is it my marketing department how are they using these tools what tools are they using so for instance you can do that for your data loss prevention technology that may already be a company so for instance if i visit a website that my law firm says is a no-no like gmail I get a big circle with a red line saying you're prohibited from using this website and an alert is sent to our IS department. You can do something similar and monitor uh, employee use of various web-based platforms um, and, and, and things like that to understand you know, over three months who's using it, how are they using it, are they you know, downloading large amounts of data from a protected SharePoint and where is that? where are they then going to really sort of help you understand how it's being used so when you're developing a policy but also for training to understand the risks because I think, as I mentioned earlier, one of the key points is how is this being used within your company and developing a policy that fits the use within your company and your company's sort of intended use and, and business objectives. So we'll go to the next slide, please. So an AI audit. So at the outset of developing a policy, it is important to understand how it's being used by your employees. You need to sort of look at your the company's contracts, the licenses that you may have already signed with AI providers, although I feel like a lot of companies today are trying to sell AI services that may not really be AI services at all, you know, it's, it's a shiny new toy, but again, publicly available websites, that's key. Um, OpenAI has, for instance, now an enterprise version, but a lot of other tools don't. So it's good to sort of assess, you know, the, 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 the web-based platforms that people might be using. And as Teresa mentioned, of course, there's always a risk of somebody doing something um, foolish on a personal device like a phone, but you can't really control for that all the time. Um, you need to discuss the use cases, um, talk to your employees, different people in different uh, departments at IS or marketing or finance, right? is the tool being used the best tool for, for this task? Um, are there better tools? Um, are there tools that have, you know, that are, that are reported to have you know, more accurate outputs, less hallucinations? You know, OpenAI is constantly putting out press releases about uh, enhancements to their technology and either sort of, uh, uh, sort of reducing the number of false statements and inaccuracies and outputs. So it definitely will require some research. Um, it also require a good um, scanning of the terms and, and conditions of a, of a provider that you sign a license with. So for instance, are they clearly telling you that your prompts or your company data is not gonna end up in your training, in their training data? And that's not always so clear in the in the licenses and the contracts that I've that I've reviewed. So you want to make sure that that is clearly called out. Um, and of course, you have to identify existing security measures and vulnerabilities, not just external hackers, but also internal threats um, as well. So I don't know if you guys have any any additional insight on the on these points here. Yep, Matt, I'd like to kind of dig a little bit into the visibility into the system and understanding of the training data. Um, a couple of things because. A lot of times you get this image of 
when people talk about there's a data lake and there's algorithms, and then we've got this you know little interface on top of the generative AI, whether it's Bard or ChatGPT or Grok. And it gives the illusion that there's this carefully curated large language model and carefully curated algorithm. And that, you know, I kind of get this vision of like data scientists and lab coats that are tagging all of the data so that when you put your prompt engineering queries in there, you, you get something, even if it's a hallucination, but there's some kind of a level of rigor and data, data science to it. What people really need to realize is, you know, with the exception of when you're training things on your own data, if you're using a commercially available model, you don't really know exactly what it was trained on and the ability to poison the algorithms that are training on the data, the ability to poison the lake that's the data lake that's tra training is a real thing. The other piece is a lot of the data tagging that's going on is done by untrained professionals who are paid below minimum wage. Um, around the world, a lot of it is offshore to outsource. These are nameless, faceless, hardworking people who are tagging the data for a lot of these um, vendor platforms that are being used. And so I, I really want people to kind of walk away understanding if you're gonna make an investment in this and you're gonna do anything kind of customer facing, you really want to choose your vendors wisely. You want to ask them, how do you protect against algorithm poisoning? How do you protect against data poisoning? How was this trained? How do you test for unconscious engineering bias? And then if we are to put our own data into a private uh, data lake, how do we ensure that's what our trade secrets are that's in our private data lake for our use, how do we ensure that that stays our trade secrets? And I think that's a really important thing. I don't want to just slow people down from thinking about how to adopt this and how to improve your operations and your customer service, but it, everything is not as it appears. You know, generative AI and AI algorithms have been around a long time. The genius of where we are right now is you have this interface that's super easy to interact with. We didn't have that before. You'd have to sit at a command prompt and write and write code to interact with the technology. Now you can do voice assist or you can type a prompt as if you're having a conversation. And with that ease of user interface, it actually masks, which is, you know, the data lake instead of being a pristine koi pond with bonsai and lily pads, it's like a muddy data lake and there's tires at the bottom. Like there's like everything in there. Um, so I, I just want to kind of get that point across because it's so important as people start to put their operational processes on top of this technology. Hey, Bridget, I know there's a question in the- Yeah, I was going to go ahead, Matt, if it's okay. Teresa, a question for you back to the executive order. Uh, the question is, can you explain more about the regulations applying to infrastructure providers? What kind of infrastructure? Yeah, so right now, okay, so I'll, I actually wrote these notes down. So right now it's for infrastructure as a service providers. And this is actually, if you look at section four and section five, they start to talk about um, kind of intellectual property risks. And then when they go into um, section um the next section, they actually talk about uh, if you're doing infrastructure as a service using generative AI services, they are compelling the departments and agencies first in this executive order to register foreign agents who are going to access generative AI and be able to build things in an infrastructure as a service. My open question, because this is a new executive order and the regulations to support the order have not been written yet. My open question for us in the business world and the private sector world is, what will we be compelled to do? So if you end up using infrastructure as a service to create customer service chatbots, and you're doing that for your organization, are you going to be compelled to collect this kind of information? That is an open question. So I, it's a great question that you have. It's an open question for myself. What we do know is, is the departments and agencies that are compelled under this infrastructure as a service, they've got about 90 days to get the plan back in on, on how they're thinking about this. They've got another 
90 days after that to start creating sort of the metrics and the implementation. Um, so it, it, it'll be one of those things uh, we'll kind of learn, um, but really the devil's in the details. So we're going to have to see what the departments and agencies come back with a response to this section of the executive order. Well, next slide. <clears throat> so here are some of the risk management considerations to think about when formulating an AI policy. And we try to give you some really some fine bullet points, but also make them as comprehensive as possible. So obviously there's risks to your organizations, right? Business operations that the AI, the misuse of AI can result in. Of course, we've talked about loss of trade secrets, misuse of private data, and therefore your know, lawsuits, statutory violations, regulatory inquiries, et cetera, monetary losses, security breaches, which Teresa has already talked about, poisoning attacks, but there's also something called inversion attacks. I mean, AI systems are hackable. They are at the end of the day software. And so those security breaches can be both um, internal and external. Reputational damages, right? Or the injury to, to goodwill. Um, there hasn't been a major hack yet, like a giant credit card breach, but I'm assuming that's gonna come at some point. Regulatory scrutiny, once the regulations are in place, I think the FTC and you know, it's just waiting to start sending inquiries or reaching out to people with companies with questions, litigation. We've seen a number of, of lawsuits being filed class action lawsuits for uh, statutory violations of, of privacy statutes, but majority have been uh, copyright uh, type lawsuits. But this summer, the EEOC settled its first employment uh, litigation uh, complaint about uh, automated decision-making tools uh, in the workplace, courts risks to people, misuse of intellectual property. Uh, for instance, are your employees creating marketing material with copyrighted images in them? misuse of sensitive personal information, which we've talked about um, a lot today, discrimination and bias, which we haven't talked about a little bit, but there are issues because the, the training data is biased because it's collected by humans, it's designated by humans as the training data. The algorithms are biased because they're written by people. And so for instance, if you know, a medical device or some software is being used to prepare diagnoses of medical conditions, right, is the training data only really touching on um, or, or ignoring like underserved or underrepresented communities that might not be within the training data and misdiagnoses, for instance, or not be able to make proper recommendations for, you know, black females when the majority of patients treated by that hospital system historically might have been, you know, white males with a, a different sort of economic background. And of course, there are some broader risks like supply chain issues and environmental concerns as well. I know Teresa getting further. Oh, okay. AI policy consideration. So we can we can jump ahead. I know we're getting a little short on time here. Um, so again, another way of thinking about it, one of my big takeaways, our big takeaways is to be proactive. And another way of thinking about it is safety first or just do no harm, is my view. And I'm sure Teresa and Bridget share this view that safety first is probably the, the better approach. And as we talked about, AI risks should not be considered in isolation, right? They're part of your larger strategy within your company, part of the other policies that you have in place. And how is this going to be used within your business case? And what are the risks to your business and your customers and your employees as well? Um, we've talked a little bit about applicable laws and regulations. The executive order is gonna set off a lot of work, both within the government and within companies, because it's gonna require reporting by the government. It also talks about requiring companies to share training data, um, testing results with the government. And I think companies are gonna be a little hesitant to do so. And it's going to take a while, I think, for companies to even understand what their obligations are. And they're going to be forced upon them sooner rather than later. And so there's going to be a lot of discussion with, um, you know, internally with your, your CISO, your information security people, in-house legal, within HR, about how to handle all of these issues. And then in an accountability framework, uh, my view on the AI policy is that it needs to be clear. Uh, if an employee, of course, intentionally does something they shouldn't do, they're, they can be terminated. But you know, today we've really been talking about best practices. And I think one of the goals to sort of communicate to your employees and training and awareness is that AI is a powerful tool and the consequences for misuse and even sloppy misuse, like we talked about with the Samsung employees can be can be significant. Uh, Teresa, do you have any, any further thoughts on this slide? Yeah, sure. So that there is a conversation uh, section around um, you know, basically the executive order has compelled the Consumer Financial Protection Board and the FHA, for example, 
uh, on sort of this do no harm and, and bias and discrimination. There, the executive order actually says um, under their authorities, and I think they use the word sort of like with their discretion, they will approach financial services industry and others to compel them to show how they don't have bias and discrimination in their use of generative AI, whether it's decision engines, algorithms, uh, denying services, routing access, you know, what, whatever it happens to be. And so again, I think this is where starting with your guiding principles as a company, regardless of the technology that you use, just go back and double check that and make sure you've you've got that all in hand. And then you can look at this technology as you start implementing it and ask yourself, how will I govern to make sure that this is doing something that is in compliance with our own policy as a company, as well as with state and national and international laws. All right, next slide, please. And so as we talked about for the last 55 minutes, right, it's important to establish governing principles. And here are some of the key takeaways, like when, or to identify when can your company use AI and for what kind of tools are you going to use? There is a big, I think a big difference between the automated decision-making tools, such as the resume screeners, the applicant screeners, job performance reviewers, facial recognition software. I mean, there are even vending machines that monitor financial transactions. Um, Generative AI, of course, some of the IP concerns we've talked about, quality control, training is very important. There needs to be regular training. It shouldn't just be once and then we're done because the technology is changing so quickly. The use cases are changing. Your company is developing new products and services. So AI might need to be used in 18 months for a different purpose than it is today, especially, for instance, if there is a merger or an acquisition of a business and they have uh, different products and they have different uh, data sets. Um, so you have to sort of keep your employees aware. And of course, awareness is important as well. So it's things as simple as, you know, a, um, a pop-up on, on, on your computer, right? When you log in every morning and maybe instead of your, your company's logo, something that says, hey, if you're going to use this program, be sure not to, boom, put in, you know, HIPAA protected information or, or sensitive information. Um, understanding your disclosure obligations. Of course, there's HIPAA and other regulations and statutes that are really going to start taking shape. The EU's AI Act is going to be a big deal when that um, goes into effect probably later this year or early next year. So we're going to have to understand the implications to what that means for, for companies in the U.S. that do business in the EU. And then I'm sure California will follow suit. Gavin Newsom has already put out his own quote-unquote executive order. So it's going to be interesting how the landscape shakes out over the next 12 to 18 months. And then, you know, third-party risk. I'm sure Teresa has some thoughts on this as well. But um, we've all been talking about what's happening with employees within our own organization. We also have to be mindful of, you know, who are our vendors that have our data? What are they doing with it? Are we able to go on site and see what they're doing, audit their processes, and really get an understanding of, you know, are they being responsible? And what happens when something goes wrong? Do our contracts have, for instance, breach notification provisions, indemnity provisions, and will they cooperate with us in a meaningful, meaningful fashion to respond to our regulatory inquiries or help if there's a lawsuit, for instance. Yeah, Matt, I agree with everything you said there. And um, the other thing, when I think about sort of the journey of, of getting to that point of sort of assessments, audits, and then breach notification, incident response playbooks around, around this is Start by asking all of your third party vendors, and this is all the way down to the teeny tiny ones that maybe you guys are using for marketing or customer listening, and you're, you know, it's a, a low nominal fee, but you want to be thinking about even them, even the smaller vendors, asking them for self attestation. And it can start very simple. And then you can start to see the responses you get back that you don't get a warm and fuzzy about to actually decide to go a little deeper based on how they interact with your customer data, your trade secrets, your infrastructure. And it can start as simple as this. Um, in your self-attestation letter, let us know the last time you did all employee training on uh, generative AI, what it's allowed to be used for, um, show me the language in your employee handbook that you have your employees sign off on. Uh, third, do you have a third party do an assessment of you 
and how your generative AI has been implemented. And can I see that report as it relates to the services I'm buying from you? So you can see where this letter can be very simple and very low lift for your vendors to at least get back to you. You're not saying, please get out the NIST framework. There, by the way, there's a new NIST framework that's gonna be developed around generative AI. Um, but you know, you, you're not asking them, can you get out a thousand controls and rate yourself on your maturity model for the controls? Just start first with a very simple, you know, ask your internal or external legal counsel to help you write it and just ask them to kind of do a census for you on how they're doing this. And then from there, you can kind of push forward. Bridget, you probably got an opinion on this as well. I was just gonna add on to the third party risk, given that we know that last year was the number one source of most breaches came from third parties. The level of seriousness when it comes to um, treating that third party risk process is paramount. Um, it needs to be in the questionnaire and it needs to be to be addressed. And as Teresa said, you'll, you'll know pretty quickly by the answers you get. Um, and my favorite is the NA not applicable um, is, is really the one that gives me the most pause. So it looks like we're at two o'clock. Let me jump ahead to a couple yep. of slides so that we can just keep everybody, uh, keep on track here. And it's the slide that has the CLE code at the back of it. Here we go. And this is, I think, some of our other big takeaways. And so you'll see here at the bottom, CLE code number two is 46821. But if I want to leave everybody with my third and final takeaway, it's the last bullet point, is that AI documents or policies or living documents need to be re revisited periodically, at this point, I would say even more frequently than one year and updated um, to really reflect how the tools are being used by your company and then communicated without the organization. And then I think sort of the other sort of important takeaways, documenting AI usage within your company. Um, don't allow your employees to rely on the honor code, the honor system, because it's not gonna work. Um, what I've been counseling companies on is something as simple as, you know, if an employee wants to use AI for a tool, Gen AI for a tool, have them put it in writing, get written authorization from a manager, and then put that, that authorization, that request somewhere, whether it's in an Excel spreadsheet or a company database, so you have that information for the future. It can be tracked. For instance, if a regulator comes and has questions about what happened or why was this data um, disclosed, you'll then have an understanding of who used it for what purpose and why. And Teresa and Bridget, any, any closing thoughts before we, uh, at the end of the hour here? None for me. Thanks for having us, Matt. Enjoy the conversation. Yeah, thanks for inviting us to join you, Matt. And uh, thanks to everybody who made the time for this today. Well, thank you, everyone. So this concludes today's webinar. Remember to keep an eye out for our follow-up email, which will include links to the program, materials, and the recording. And you should also know that Cell Ewing has an AI working group uh, where we think about these issues on a daily basis, and we are looking to set up roundtables for a more intimate discussion of AI-related issues. So please feel free to reach out if you have any follow-up questions or want to be part of a roundtable or a further discussion. And I think that's it for the day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody.